So uh, we'll have a quick uh, introduction. I'll, I'll go on to uh, the essential strabismus workup, and then we'll we'll move on to uh, refraction, uh, binocularity, and amblyopia therapy, uh, decision making in strabismus surgery, and end with a few uh, videos of strabismus surgery. So uh, I would request my co-panelists, uh, Dr. Digvijay, who will join us in a bit, Dr. Swati, and Dr. Ankur on the dais, please. So I'll uh, so I'll uh, start with. So we were we were just talking. Uh, we start. We've been having all day our pediatric ophthalmology, and uh, basically everything that we are going to discuss comes and can be put into what we uh, have on this flow chart here. So you have a strabismus. It could be a pseudo strabismus, a latent strabismus, or a manifest strabismus. A pseudo strabismus being that it is actually not there but appears to be there. A latent strabismus is that uh, a strabismus is there but gets controlled by uh, dynamic factors like fusion or accommodation. A manifest strabismus, which could be a comitant or an incomitant strabismus. Uh, the uh, basic workup uh, always in strabismus requires a fair amount of chair time, and you need to have a bit of history to this. You need to know the presenting complaints like asthenopia, diplopia, the presence of strabismus of how long, when was the age of onset and the duration, uh, the pattern of deviation, whether it's intermittent, constant, uh, the CMI is deviating, or there is an alternation to the strabismus, uh, what is the precipitating factor, and is there any treatment that, that was given. Uh, besides that, of course, developmental history is very important because many of these conditions coexist in children with strabismus and sometimes can, can get missed. So the parents really notice the strabismus and do not notice the developmental delay that the child was having or that if it is the only child, they have no way of comparing the delayed milestones. So it's very important to ask for and identify if there has been any perinatal insult and if there is any associated developmental issues. These are visual milestones that we uh, that are grossly there, the most important being that by two months, the child can fix and follow and has a facial recognition of the mother. So a social smile will start coming at two months because the child will start recognizing the mother. Subsequently, of course, by five months, the, uh, the onset of stereopsis is there and a fair amount of binocularity develops. And by this time, if there is any misalignment, starts becoming an important issue for us. Uh, subsequently, the age, uh, as the child matures, the visual system also develops. And although we used to call seven, eight years is the end of real critical period, but there is actually no end. And children tend to, uh, the visual functions tend to develop even beyond. And as we know, we can even treat these conditions like amblyopia at much, much an older age. Uh, most importantly, the assessment of visual acuity, of course, if it's a verbal child who can read uh, and understand, we uh, can use the standard charts. But otherwise, you have these visual uh, measurement systems which can be very helpful. So this is the teller. Uh, this is the car, the teller and this is the Cardiff. The Cardiff is for a little older children from one and a half years to two and a half to three years. And this is for about six months onwards to about one and a half years. Uh, the, the speciality of these cards are that they have this principle of vanishing optotype. So if the child is not able to see these structures, the gratings in this case and these structures in this case, these do not become visible and they merge into the gray background. So that's why they are called vanishing optotypes. If he's not able to resolve, they vanish. And of course, it's a basis of the visual assessment system is called a preferential looking system. So the child will preferentially look at, an, uh, at a design or a shape or a structure as compared to the blank background. And that's what we are recognizing for. So we are recognizing for the preference of that child to look at an object. And by repeated testing, that's how we measure. There are other methods like the optokinetic drum and VER, but they are not as accurate. And after three uh, or four years, you hope and try and get a tumbling E or an alphabet trained child uh, in identifying the actual visual acuity. Again, very, very important to identify if you don't have vision, uh, are not able to collect the visual ac acuity of a child, important to identify signs of amblyopia. Among the important things is one of the reasons why we don't operate before we uh, 
do amblyopathy is the reason that you are able to identify uh, amblyopia so the constantly deviating eye is obviously amblyopic as compared to uh, the the eye that is constantly fixing and otherwise a cover test just covering one of the eyes you can know that this eye is amblyopic because he's not uncomfortable with this eye but the moment the right eye which is the actual seeing eye is covered the child becomes uncomfortable importance of refraction and we'll be discussing that cannot be overemphasized not only accommodative esotropias but divergent squints also need to have a good pair of glasses uh, dynamic factors like accommodation fusion are key factors which control deviation so uh, a divergent squint just by correcting and improving the vision and giving good quality visual acuity may just correct Uh, an obvious manifesting divergent squint into an intermittent divergent squint which may not require surgery high refractive errors need to be always checked for centration because the moment you have a decentered glass it itself produces a prismatic effect can affect the amount of strabismus that you're observing or else also result in asthenopia so identify decentered glasses correct for decentered glasses and adjust for it in uh, uh, the Uh, measurements that you are doing always important to identify head postures uh, do not correct the head posture first identify it there can be multiple causes including nystagmus pattern strabismus and as simple as refractive errors and head postures and position of the head can be very diagnostic sometimes like in this child you can see a congenital superior oblique palsy you can see the classical mid facial hypoplasia because the child was holding his head tilted on to the left side all across as he was growing so the left side it did not grow up as uh, appropriately as before uh, so it's very very important to identify the motor status and the head posture before correcting it and uh, start making indirect conclusions based on that you can evaluate the amount of deviation first by the hirschberg test which is the corneal reflex test and the extent of decentration of the reflex will give us an idea about the deviation important that looks can be deceptive so from far this child looks as if he has an esotropia but you concentrate on the corneal light reflexes and they are well centered whenever the patient uh, parent tells us about the possibility of a strabismus and you appear that the child appears to be aligned ask the parents to take straight ahead photographs with a flash and identify whether there is actually true deviation there or not it's very helpful now in this documentable age to be able to identify whether the child was intermittently squinting and is missed here because he's not squinting at the moment or else there is too true uh, pseudo esotropia so it's very very important to observe when the child is brought in including look at the fixation process, uh, preferences head posture any other anomalies uh, you need to have a very friendly environment when you are examining children because uh, it's difficult to keep them attentive on a particular position for long always look at the static angle or the amount of deviation bereft of the dynamic factors we started talking about so accommodative esotropias can present at any age we've had children in their teens also present with accommodative esotropias so it's very very important that when a patient presents an age appropriate cycloplegic refraction is done again it's important to overall examine the child and look for lit position and palpable aperture differences and anomalies as the child uh, as the eyes move and that will help us to identify things like duan syndromes uh, pseudotosis and meds aberrant innervations and any asymmetry that can exist and may have a role to play in decision making so that you can balance that off when you are doing your surgery uh, ocular alignment we talked about the uh, the corneal light reflex you can do the bruckner's reflex that again just on the retinal reflex you get to know if the presence of squint or anisometropia and of course a cover test that will help to pick up refixation movements that can again uh, identify uh, pseudo strabismus so a bruckner's reflex can help us to identify anisometropia and esotropia exotropia we talked about pseudo so again while you have a good centered reflex if there is doubt you do a cover test to confirm true eso or true exotropias so it's important to identify whether there is a true strabismus or not whether it if it's not a presenting strabismus is there latent uh you can do a cover test to confirm tropias and then of course identify the type of squint by the refixation movement the cover test is done for tropias you cover what is the fixing eye and you see for movement in the in the apparently deviating eye uh, obviously the eye should be able to move 
the I should have some vision, a cover, uncover, or an uncover test is for four years, and you cover and then you uncover the eye and you look for the movement of redressal as the eye moves in back to take up fixation. Eye movements are the next most important thing. Versions are binocular eye movements, but must be followed by uniocular eye movements if there are any limitation of movements. You look for up gaze and down gaze to look for oblique muscles. We do usually 25 degree up gaze and 35 degree down gaze so that we are able to identify if there is any pattern. More than 10 prisms of difference in up gaze and down gaze and 15 prisms uh, for V pattern are considered significant enough to require intervention. So here you can see the presence of a V pattern and the presence of an so the V pattern gives us an idea of oblique overaction. You check for oblique in this patient. There was an inferior oblique overaction responsible for this. Uh, again, you have you do versions. There are limitation of movements. One of the possible reasons could be a cross fixating child. So you do adduction to identify complete eye movements, and it's just a comitant strabismus and not an incompetent strabismus you're looking for. The other things to look for is with and without refractive con correction to look for accommodative components. For distance and near, you identify intermittent divergent squints because looking at near, they may be accommodating or having a tenacious proximal fusion that is keeping the eye in control and they break for distance. Look at nine gazes and look for preference uh, eyes that are preferring. So this is showing you how we will look for up gaze and down gaze for patterns, a Hirschberg test that is identifying the amount of deviation that is there in eyes with poor vision, you can do a Krimsky test where uh, you can either put the prism on the deviating eye, but it's preferable to put it on the fixing eye, make the fixing eye deviate and get the abnormal eye to position itself where you want the end point to be and therefore uh, plan your surgery. In patients with good vision, a prism bar cover test, uh, a fundus evaluation in the presence of or uh, oblique overactions to look for torsion. You can take a fundus photograph and identify the position of the fovea and the presence of torsion accordingly. You have a lot of sensory examination tests and it's important that if you are looking at an endpoint of bino uh, binocularity or stereopsis, it's important to do these tests very easily available and it's important to pre-test these children. Whenever you're testing for binocularity in the presence of strabismus, remember to put a neutralizing prism and then do these tests because if the presence of deviation, they are anyway being, if they don't complain of diplopia, they're anyway suppressing or ignoring one image. So you're not going to get anything. So correct for the deviation and then do all the tests. Uh, of course, stereopsis is now increasingly being discussed. There are multiple tests available, uh, which may be easy and child friendly and they can be helpful in deciding when to intervene in divergent squints and also see for post-op outcomes. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll go on to the next talk which will be by Dr. Swati. I think that is there. So uh, Dr. Digvijay will be joining us shortly and he'll be talking about refraction. So in the meantime, Dr. Swati will be talking on restoring vision and binocularity in amblyopia. So amblyopia, a key management intervention. Can you have the slide? Uh, laptop this will arrive. Is it? Is it loaded? OK, yeah. Check short. Sure. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. And I will be first thanking Dr. Rohit for making me part of his IC. Uh, today I'll be talking about amblyopia, some old and some new concepts. How do we move, have moved beyond patches? So as we all know, amblyopia is basically unilateral or bilateral deprivation of vision because of either sensory lack of sensory stimulus or abnormal binocular interaction for which no organic gas cause can be de detected and if treated on time, it is reversible. So it can be classified as strabismic amblyopia, which is more common with esotropias as compared to exotropia. Ametropic amblyopia is seen whenever there is bilateral high refractive error in both eyes. And isometropia is basically uh, difference of refractive error in between two eyes. And visual deprivation amblyopia is the one where you are have the uh, under stimulation of retina, like in cases of congenital ptosis, congenital cataracts, or congenital corneal opacities. So early identification 
proper evaluation and timely intervention is critical for the management of amblyopia because of the cortical plasticity which is there only in critical age and that depends on number of factors like age of patient duration of low vision type of refractive error quantity of refractive error also the type of amblyopia generally the anisometropic amblyopia tend to do better as compared to strabismic or sensory deprivation amblyopia and the most important key factor is patient compliance so the basic management of amblyopia still remains the same identify the cause of visual loss correct adequately for the refractive error Pre give preferential stimulation to the amblyopic eye and the goal is to achieve the vision equal vision in each eye but now as more and more focus is there on binocularity so j not just e uh, achieving equal vision we also now want to have some that uh, so that patient should gain some amount of binocularity as well so optical correction still remains the standard therapy occlusion therapy is again a gold standard as far as amblyopia management is concerned penalization active vision therapy pharmacotherapy all are the part of amblyopia therapy for different spectrum and type of amblyopia but what is more important now is that as as advances in you know technology is coming up we have now moved on to active vision therapy which was there earlier also but has now become a kind of uh, a routine in clinical practice so optical correction optimal optical correction can never never be overemphasized is the first step of amblyopia therapy it removes the image blur and gives a patient a sharp image which is very important for stimulation of retina so there have been uh, american academy guidelines but now we have our own guidelines and national consensus guidelines which have been published by ais and are also published in ijo that these are the factors or this is the amount of refractive error which we need to beyond which which we need to give patient refractive correction they are readily available on the net or on igo the number two is occlusion therapy and it still remains the gold standard whether you have to do a partial occlusion or a full time occlusion that is not important but what is important is that the patient compliance even if it's a part time occlusion we have to make sure that patient is doing it for these uh, prescribed hours which are necessary it not only helps in uh, 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 anisometropic amblyopia but also in strabismic amblyopia maintenance of occlusion is again important so so once the equal vision has achieved it's not that we will abruptly you know uh, stop the occlusion one has to taper it over the time and it has it has been seen that the patients who have uh, who have uh, uh, for whom the occlusion therapy has been stopped abruptly recur more frequently as compared to the patients for whom there has been a tapering of uh, occlusion dose recurrence rate again in these cases is very very high and we have factors like old age onset of treatment larger visual recovery better uh, best corrected visual acuity after the treatment all these factors are related to more recurrence of uh, amblyopia penalization which can be optical or pharmacological again is an alternative therapy but we need to remember that it does not work in all cases it may not be so suitable if the uh, amblyopia is severe enough or if the vision is less than 6 by 60 because any amount of penalization is not going to decrease vision in the normal eye beyond 6 by 60 so it is reserved only for mild cases of amblyopia pharmacotherapy both levodopa acetylcholine have been tried but with not so great results there have been reports where one some improvement is seen but the effect is temporary as far as the Uh, um uh, as far as the drug continues but once you try stop the drug there is a possibility that this may recur and of course there are systemic side effects of both of them so what is more commonly uh, used up now or what is kind of emerging is active vision therapy it's an age old concept it was also given earlier in form of near vision task hand eye coordination and all such uh, such things but because of the development of uh, of the technology we now have soft software so that attracts children that makes them more attractive towards uh, more, engages them more and you know they can continue playing video games and which is a fun activity for them so it's basically the reteaching of the visual reteaching on uh, to the visual pathway again about the uh, hand eye coordination and uh, visual motor interactions in a very play way method 
so it can be monocular video games so one eye patch and patient can play video games or it is it can be dicoptic so more and more uh, dicoptic therapies co coming up which is based on virtual reality or software based where you know the uh, um, the normal eye is given some disadvantage either in form of decreased contrast or dif different eyes may have uh, different colors to dissociate them where the uh, amlyopic eye gets the advantage over the normal eye and patient is asked to is, is forced to use the amlyopic eye to play the game however all these therapies have their own um, all these therapies have their own limitations after some time children do get bored of it and sometimes if children are too young like two years or three years old they may not be so radially willing to play these games or they may not be even able to comprehend these games so for young children less than five years probably occlusion still is the gold standard while older children then you may try dicoptic therapy and also you have to keep in mind that you know after some point of time it becomes very monotonous and child may lose interest so that monitoring is also necessary with these kind of therapies so to sum up management of amlyopia the first and the most thing important thing is to rule out any other organic cause of loss of vision second most important step is to give proper uh, is to do proper cycloplegic refraction and give optimal correction which is necessary for the uh, for that age group and for that refractive error depending on whether there is squint or no squint for anisometropic amlyopia again it's the constant use of glasses followed by either conventional occlusion or active vision therapy whatever is convenient for the patient and whatever makes patient more compliant for ametropic amlyopia the standard of therapy is still correction of refractive error and occlusion there probably has no role Regular follow-up, reassessment, maintenance therapy, ensuring compliance is what is more important as far as amlyopia therapy is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swati, uh, bringing us up to date with the changes in uh, management of amlyopia. We'll now uh, move on to refraction in a child with strabismus and the key things we need to know about managing refractive errors in them. Uh, Dr. Digvijay, we have with, with us. Uh, he heads Noble Eye Clinic in uh, Gurugram and uh, has been an old uh, uh, expert in this area. So, Dr. Digvijay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Rohit, for having me as a part of your IC. And uh, I'll basically be covering the basic tips of refracting the child with strabismus or refracting the child in general as well. And uh, I think it is not displaying yet. All right. Okay. Right. Thank you. So, uh, well, when we talk about refraction, we're basically looking at different forms of refraction. Uh, for children, the gold standard is retinoscopy, continues to be retinoscopy, but there are other forms such as photorefractors or autorefractors that have basically come in. Uh, the, the predominant tips in children is that you have to be, of course, the first point number one is you have to be patient. You have to give the child time uh, for re refraction. Uh, cycloplegia is very, very important, and we'll, we'll come to each of these points as we go along. And uh, the, the child has to be, in cases of strabismus specifically, the child has to be looking straight or orthotropic at the time when you're refracting. Because if, if you're refracting an eye which is looking elsewhere, you're not going to get accurate values. So as I said, retinoscopy is the gold standard. It is, it is to be done in a dimly lit room uh, with the child. You can be in the parent's lap to make the child comfortable. You're going to use, uh, the child should be looking at a far distance object. So in your clinics, if you're, you can set up some you know, cartoons or animations or something that the child is looking at uh, at a far distance. And you can be doing uh, retinoscopy one by one. This is the gold standard, but of course, it is observe, It is dependent uh, on the skill of the person who is doing the refraction, and therefore, that's important. So, it's a skill that over time, I'm realizing that we are losing out, uh, particularly in some in the optometrists that we are doing, and something that we have to very often do on our own. But this is something that we should all know. This can also be done in a child which is who's not very cooperative, and it is the uh, uh, choice in a child when you're doing an examination under uh, anesthesia for a smaller child. Again, you have to make sure that the eye is orthotropic at that time. The other options of uh, refraction uh, are, oh, this you did, is the photorefractor. So this one that I'm using here, and I use this very often, is, is, is the plus optics. And you can see this is basically looking at photorefraction based on the, the reflex, on the pupillary reflex. 
and you have a person who's facing into this and on the uh, camera you'll get uh, two lines which are also if you can see on the side uh, if they turn green then that means a binocular refraction is happening successfully the advantage of this as you see is one that it's happening at a distance from the uh, patient so for smaller children also they are cooperative they're not scared to come close to a machine but uh, this is this cannot be uh, so far i've seen in terms of the values this cannot be the way on which you can give the refraction so you still have to do a retinoscopy to actually uh, pr uh, prescribe the refraction but it's a very good screening tool it also tells you if there's uh, the, there's an isotropia, exotropia, any, so like the Hirschberg reflex, like the Bruckner's reflex, this in fact is, follows that principle and you can actually make it out. But this is something that again as a, in the practice I found to be very useful. Auto refractors we all know uh, are there both tabletop as well as some portable ones like this one here. Uh, they have their issues with children, with very young children, it's difficult for them to sit. But uh, And also if there is a, there's a restriction in mobility of the eye then also auto refractors are not very accurate and they do cause an accommodation effect to be there. So obviously a full cycloplegia has to be there before you're able to take up the child on this. A lot of times you'll get pseudomyopias, even if you're given some basic cycloplegic drops, if the full cycloplegic effect has not come in. Then there are open view auto refractors, which have also come in to the market here, where you can see far across. So the child can hold this in their hand, but again requires a little older child, uh, and they can be looking at a far distance object, again like a cartoon or an animation that you have uh, somewhere you know, on the other end of the room, and this can do a refraction in that. Again, it can do a binocular refraction, but in strabismus cases, you have to do it unilocularly. You cannot do a binocular refraction in those cases. Moving to the cycloplegia, that's important, and we know that cycloplegia is very important. A refraction in a child should never be done without cycloplegia. The cycloplegia of choice varies. So if you've got a young child below five, or if you've got a child with an isotropia, those cases you have to use atropine as a cycloplegic. Cyclopentolate is an option that is close to atropine but has other effects uh, as well. Um, some of them have included the child getting irritable or screaming and it doesn't sometimes get the full cycloplegic effect that atropine does. And atropine is also more comfortable to put in the child because the child is not going to sit with his eyes closed when you put cyclopentolate but it is an option. Most of the times we recommend atropine and this is something that you should follow as a standard. Uh, in older children or children who are orthotropic you could consider homide or homotropine and that uh, also does a good job. But I think the, and sometimes we do a combination such as a cyclopentolate, tropicamide cyclopentolate as well, which can be used in the older children. But the, it's also very important to know when to refract after doing the cycloplegia. So you don't, in atropine, of course, the effect is going to last a long time. But in homide, you don't want to do it hours after you've given it. It's best to be done within that one hour period in tropicamide uh, within the 25 minute period of the last drop. Uh, some uh, specific points from uh, for isotropia standpoint, you would be giving full cyclopegic correction that you will be getting in these cases. So there, you're not doing an acceptance uh, for these smaller children in any case. Also, there are uh, special lenses you have to sometimes give. In accommodative cases, you'll be giving uh, bifocal glasses, and we'll, we'll come to a couple of cases of those as well as we go along. But there are certain specific pearls that are useful, and you want to give the highest plus. In exotropia, you can give, uh, again, you have to give the appropriate refractive correction. You could give a slightly over minus to help the uh, control the squint better, or you could decenter them outwards to give an effect where they have to now converge more to see, or like a base out effect in these cases as well. But and for cylinders, you want to be giving a full uh, uh, appropriate cylindrical correction. In anisometropia, with squint, if there's a large anisometropic difference, then sometimes you know you may want to consider contact lenses or high index glasses. Do the refraction independently, and because you also have to do occlusion therapy there, that way you can use the higher power glass as well. But again, it has to be individualized in those cases. Prism glasses are available, which can correct uh, small uh, squints or residual squints after surgeries, over or under corrections after surgeries. They could have the prism inbuilt into the glass. You could use a Fresnel prism on top of the glass, such as in these cases that you are seeing here. So this is, let's come to a few cases very quickly. This is a accommodative isotropia, a small child. Given full cyclopegic correction, you can see how the isotropia has corrected. In exotropias, like this intermittent exotropia, just by giving optical correction, sometimes you get very good control and you have to do nothing beyond that. So optical correction, appropriate optical correction is very important. In children with high AC by A ratio, you want to give bifocal glasses, make sure that the near segment bisects and the, the, the connection between the near and, near and upper, uh, the lower and the upper segment bisects the pupil so that the child is using the lower part for the near and the upper part for the distance viewing. In partially accommodative isotropias, you have to give glasses first and then whatever residual squint is left, you have to correct. So this first step is very, very important to give the appropriate uh, refractive correction. Otherwise, you'll, your uh, decision on the surgery may be uh, different or you may not make the right decision. 
uh, prism glasses, I'll show one case. This was a patient who had a large angle exotropia as a young child. I had operated slight residual, uh, slight overcorrection in a consecutive esotropia, but this got corrected with prism glasses, a small prism glass. So again, some the prism glasses do come handy. So the take home message, I think, is patients, when you're refracting a child, you must make sure that your patient, the parent is patient only, then the child will be patient or cooperative. They will be, often be uncooperative. You may want to call them a second time around. Always do a full cyclopegic correction. Plan the uh, correction according to the kind of squint that you're getting. And uh, also you have to, one thing more important here, in fact, is that I missed out is that you have to also teach the parents how to take care of the glasses. They need to clean the glasses regularly. The child also has to be slightly older children can actually be trained to do it themselves. So even the choice of gl glasses, flexible frames, hypoallergenic frames, plastic lenses and uh, care of the glasses is important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tikvijay. We now move on to the more meaty part of the session, which is on strabismus surgery. And we'll start with decision-making in strabismus, Dr. Ankur Sinha. Uh, we'll probably try and have the questions in the end. Uh, it's a short time for the course, so uh, we'll quickly go through uh, our discussions and then maybe we can take Q&As. Uh, can we have Dr. Ankur's presentation up? Any comments in the meantime? Can you put on the please? slides, please? Just... Yes. So any, any comments in the meantime while we are getting up the slides on uh, refraction, on workups, any experience on the ARs? So... Uh, uh, I would still say that uh, automated retino uh, re refraction is plays a, a less than important role. We still prefer with the uh, manual retinoscopy as the gold standard. We'll start with this and decision making, and then maybe we come back. Yes, Doctor Ankur. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor Rohit sir. Thank you, Ayers, for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking in brief about the decision making in strabismus surgery. So we have already discussed the prerequisites before surgical planning, the good refraction, proper glasses, assessment of uh, visual equity, treatment of amblyopia, assessment of strabismus, history, the sensory status and the motor status. So let us think about the planning of surgeries. So I'll be just talking about the basics. So we basically talk about two kinds of uh, principles in the surgery, that is the weakening and the strengthening. And we have to understand that there is no true weakening or true strengthening of muscles, it is just the alteration of the length tension curve because true weakening will cause limitation of rotation and true strengthening is actually increasing the muscle power, which we don't do. So various common procedures for the recti, we talk about recti here, is recessions and the fardin. Uh, lesser known are the marginal myotomy, myectomy and the free tenectomies. The strengthening procedures are resection and tuck or plication. The lesser known are the advancement and cinching. So, this table summarizes the maxima and minimum of uh, all the recti muscles from their point of insertion. So if you go beyond maximum and minimum, you will have some undesirable results in terms of limitation of excursion or uh, removing of the muscle tissue rather than the tendon. Now a few points should be borne in mind before we plan surgery that bilateral recessions should be planned under GA because if at all they cause any lid or globe changes, they cause equal changes. The, uh, also the recession is reversible, we are not losing any tissue. Uh, recession resections, if they are planned together, they give more effect per millimeter muscle of surgery and it should always be kept in mind that no more than two recti per sitting or no more than three recti per lifetime should be operated on the same eye. Now there can be widening and narrowing of the palpable aperture with large recessions and large resections which can cause widening and narrowing. Ptosis uh, or lit interactions with the vertical muscle surgery, whether it is inferior rectus or superior rectus. So whenever we plan a lateral rectus surgery, uh, make sure that the inferior oblique is not included as it has been shown that in up to one third of cases, inferior oblique fibers can be included in the surgery. If you're planning for an MR surgery, be careful while passing the sutures, especially when the muscles, muscle is tight. It is uh, prone to pitting and uh, losing, uh, being lost in the orbit. 
When you plan for inferior rectus surgery, there's a direct and proportional effect on the low lid, uh, position of the lower lid. So do not uh, go beyond 5 millimeters. Also try and do a good dissection of the cap capsular pal palpable fa uh, fascia, which is 5 millimeters behind the insertion. For superior rectus surgery, severe the insertions between the LPS and superior rectus, otherwise they can cause uh, lid retractions, more so when you are doing a larger surgery, specifically, specifically for DVDs. Now we talk about surgical dosage because that is what is more important. Uh, recession is a stronger surgery than resection and medial recti tend to be more strong muscles than lateral recti. So medial rectus uh, can give up to 3 to 4 uh, prism diopters per millimeters of surgery as compared to lateral rectus which can only give you 2 to 3 uh, prism diopters. Larger deviations tend to respond more, younger patients tend to respond more as compared to elders. Axial lens, they have an inverse correlation with the dose response in the exotropia, but not in the exotropia. Then there are certain patient factors and surgeon factors which are, you know, to be, to be considered. Now look at this patient. So we have a patient of exotropia having a 30 prism diopters of ESO without glasses and 50 without, uh, with the glasses. So this is a case of partially uh, accommodative exotropia and we are going to correct only the deviation which is with glasses. We check for nine gazes. There is no A or V pattern, no oblique overactions. So we just plan for one MR, that is right medial lectus recession by five millimeters, and we get a good result. Another case here, the case, uh, case of divergent squint, uh, there are no AV pattern, no oblique overactions, and the patient has a deviation which is dis but equal for distance and near around 45 prism diopters. Now how do we plan this? So we have to correct 45 prism diopters, so we plan for LR recession by 8.5 and MR resection for six millimeters. How do we reach to this figure? The, 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 we have already discussed that LR can give you about approximately two millimeters um, per uh, uh, two prism diopters per millimeter, and MR gives you around three prism diopters per millimeter. So a total of 35 millimeters, uh, 35 prism diopters can be done with the MR and LR surgery alone. But when we do a combination of R and R, approximately 25 percent more uh, effect is there. So combining the two surgeries together will give you approximately 44 prism diopters. And then there can be some factors which could be because of the surgeon or the patient factors, there could be some variation. So this is the post-operative uh, result. We can see the patient is pretty well aligned. Now this is another case where we have a consecutive isotropia, bilateral LR surgery has been done and the patient has a 30 prism diopters of consecutive isotropia with diplopia. So looking back the records, the patient had uh, intermittent divergent squint in the first photograph and then this is the post-op photograph on the right side. The patient had a manifest IDS of 30 prism diopters basin and a TNO of 20, 120 seconds of arc, so she did require a surgery because her stereo equity was falling down. For such a surgery, we would have planned bilateral recessions of 7 millimeters because 7 into 2 will make 14 and 14 into 2 will make 28, so trying to be a little bit under correct or maybe 7.5 millimeters would have been done for this case. And there was no limitation of movements. But here what happens is when we do this 7, it should have given 28 prism diopters, but it gave you approximately 60 prism diopters. So this is double the, the double the surgical dosage, uh, double the uh, uh, um, response to the surgical dosage which we had planned. So this is a consecutive isotropia, and for a normal uh, isotropia of 30 prism diopters, I would have planned bilateral MR by 5 millimeters. But in this case, since the dose response was nearly doubled, we just planned with one MR recession of five millimeters and the patient uh, is absolutely controlled, uh, absolutely well aligned with the isophoria of two to four prism diopters. So such calculations can only be done when the surgeon's factors are known and the patient factors are there which are uh, in front of you. Now a few other considerations, if there is a distance near variation in the deviation, there are pattern deviations, oblique overcorrection, oblique overactions, DVDs, head postures, limitation of movement, we all have to in, uh, in, uh, include that in the decision making. So if there is a distance near variation, if there is an isotropia, recheck glasses, proper glasses to be given, bifocals, my, my Farden can be uh, added for non-accommodative convergence axis type of isotropia. And if there is an uh, intermittent divergent squint, which is more for distance, LR recession is a uh, procedure of choice. If it is more for near, MR resection can also be preferred. So this is, we have already discussed about the A and the V pattern in the previous lecture, so I'm just going to skip that. So whenever you have uh, oblique overactions, try to do the uh, uh, muscle which is responsible for this A, uh, uh, A and V pattern. If it is an over oblique overaction, try to operate oblique rather than displacing the rectile muscles up or down. So whenever we think of uh, shifting the muscles up and down, it is the medial rectus which is always shifted towards the apex of A or V. 
to not miss the obliques. So this is a case of consecutive exo with inferior oblique overactions. The surgery was done elsewhere, so we went ahead with the inferior oblique surgery along with the horizontal components. So we can note the elevation in adduction showing you inferior oblique overactions. Another case of uh, isotropia with A pattern with superior oblique overactions, and we can see there is uh, uh, depression in adduction in both the eyes suggesting of superior oblique overactions. Now this is a case of a DVD with uh, uh, divergent squint. So here we see that the patient is having exotropia, which is increasing both in up and the uh, down gazes. This is probably because of the nasal bridge, which is uh, disrupting the fusion. There's no significant inferior oblique overactions, and uh, the patient is having uh, uh, a DVD, which can be assessed um, in this video. So we can see the DVD in the left eye, the eye goes out and up. Similarly, there is a DVD in the right eye, where the eye goes up and out again. So the patient has a bilateral DVD. So what we plan here is uh, 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 right superior rectus recession by seven millimeters and left superior rectus recession by seven, uh, 10 millimeters because of asymmetry and left LR recessions by five millimeter. The exo here was 14 prism diopters. So we tend to undercorrect the exo or overcorrect the exo in such calculations because the recessions of superior rectus is going to uh, in, uh, um, kind of create little bit of ESO uh, in these patients. And this is the seven weeks post-surgery and this is the video after surgery where we can see the slight amount of DVD is still left but it, uh, the, more or less the patient is pretty well controlled. So for good outcomes, uh, we have to look into all the factors. For paralytic squint, there is no, uh, no, no nomogram which can be applied. Accurate measurement of deviation and sensory status is very important. Good assessment of eye movements and specific tests, uh, if needed, should be done like an FDT or an active post-generation test in these cases. Choice of correct procedures is important because to ach achieve good results, we have to know what we are planning to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankur. Uh, thank you. We'll now just go on to videos and then take a few questions if there are any. Uh, Dr. Ankur is actually... Could I have the slides? I'm sorry. So, uh, Dr. Ankur has act already mentioned about uh, the various weakening and strengthening procedures. Graded recessions of the recti are the most commonly done. For inferior or weak, we uh, either for inferior or superior, we do not believe in free tenectomies, uh, tenotomies, tenectomies, myectomies. Uh, any procedure should be graded so that know your own gra know your own gra uh, dose response curve, which can be slightly different from what has been reported. So there are always many. Identify and know the problems that are there so that you need to be anatomically good. Uh, do not do over recession problems with that. You have associated anomalies or problems with that. So we just go on to a recession. Uh, so this is so this is a foreign temporal incision, temporal incision of the conjunctiva and the tenons is made. The lateral rectus is hooked with the gemisons and a non tooth hook. When you are now when you are now prolapsing this muscle out of this opening, it doesn't slip because of this hook here. You identify and you pass and you pass your lens hook there to make sure that you have clear sclera. So it's very important to identify clear sclera and split as you are split as you are now dissecting. You do a variable amount of dissection. Uh, different surgeons have different amounts beyond what you have the amount of recession or resection you have planned. Your suture passage uh, will depend upon whether you're using uh, one. You can have one. You can have one. Uh, not in the middle to prevent a central sag when you are passing the sutures on the sclera. You need to ideally have a three only you, uh, this, only you uh, this is using uh, two, uh, uh, one single armed, uh, double armed, sorry, six so vical after passing the sutures as you prefer. You go away from where you hold it from away from where you're going to make a mark because you don't want that area distorted. Make sure that you're perpendicular to the cornea and you're along the any upshift or down without causing any upshift or downshift if it is not planned. You pass your sutures, this is the most delicate part, you need to pass it gently, carefully, make sure that you see the fine, make sure that there are fine, make sure that there are no tissues that are in the knot because when they contract, they're going to cause limitation of movement. You remove attachments, nicely sutured there, you remove attachments, you cut the knot, and you close the conjunctiva with 6-O vicryl. You can uh, particularly make sure that the stump, make sure that the stump is not visible. Sometimes that can be a cause for concern for the patient's post-op. You just close the conjunctiva the way uh, 
you normally would, so uh, may be sufficient. Uh, we know strengthening procedures, the recti resections, oblique plications are the, again, you know, and you, you know, and you have a clear cut dose response curve. You again have limits of uh, maximum limits for resection. The tenderness, the tenderness part, if you start resecting more, you will remove some myofibrils, which may actually be a weakening kind of a procedure. So, we know affording conjunctival incision followed by a, the tenon incision, you reach the sclera and then you make the O followed by the greens, followed by the greens hook. You prolapse the muscle out, all the steps isolating the muscle are almost sure that you sure that you do not have muscle fibers or tendon fibers that are slipped onto the uh, over the hook and you're going to resect you're going to resect or plicate so that you do not have any uh, attachments or tissues uh, that uh, uh, you uh, you hold it uh, you stretch the muscle you make sure that you uh, do not cause this in the uh, muscle the uh, muscle hook so you need to make sure that your measurements are accurate these are the reasons why uh, we have surprises two double arm two double arm 60 vicrils are used uh, and the muscle is uh, the sutured you can do a light cut and again remove the stump make sure that your uh, insertion part is clean you pass it from the stump through this it can cut through and then only because otherwise it can cut through and then you can have a reduced effect or you can even have a lost muscle. Uh, you make sure that uh, uh, you have knots, one superior, uh, double armed knots, one superior, one inferior because these muscles are usually on a bit of a pull. So you need two knots uh, to make sure onto the sclera, onto the sclera. And uh, again, the conjunctival closure is just the way you would normally. Uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the, the ease, uh, la the less amount of pain and bleeding that you're going to get, but effectively we have not as far as outcomes, as far as outcomes are concerned. Uh, again, just kind of running through the same thing again, it's a muscle you are going to because sometimes when, uh, when the assistant pulls this traction, there may be a little wrong muscle on that you hook the wrong muscle and you start your surgery on the wrong muscle and you suddenly realize that it's looking uh, very unusual. This was right up to the right up to the limbus to make sure that the whole muscle has been hooked and you don't have any uh, missed fiber. Identify your, mu identify your muscle, you make sure that you dissect it to the adequate amount you want. While measurements are the same, you need to make sure it is the amount of hook and it is the amount of plication that you're planning. Uh, is as what you wanted. In plication, we use two single arm to cut. So if if it's the primary one you're doing, I still cut the 6 vicral. So I have two single arm 6 vicral. I pass it through the point where I want to plicate. Uh, so this at the mark, I make sure that I make two or three passes right through the uh, meat of the muscle so that the hold is go. Sometimes there may be insertion points. So sometimes there may be a little bit of tissue there. You make sure that you have dissected that. You identify just where the insertion is here to this insertion, here to this insertion point. Both these sutures are passed here. So you have your muscle attachment now going right uh, properly, just anti another passage back and make another passage through the muscle from where we had passed earlier. So it's a muscle, sclera, muscle, and you have really and two loops inferiorly. So you are back to having two loops like you had when you were planning your resection. If you lift them straight, you can use the iris repositor, and sometimes I don't even, old gets, old gets to go underneath the uh, advanced muscle or the plicated muscle. And you don't have a signal kind of, uh, like very large, sometimes it kind of uh, like, ear holes coming out on the side, but usually uh, modest amount of plications, you don't have that knuckle coming up. It's not even visible in the, it's not even visible in the post-op through the conjunctiva. So again, you close the conjunctiva uh, like you normally would. And as I is when I'm doing a muscle transplant or when I'm doing a shift procedure. So if I'm doing shifting, action and shifting, so action and shifting, so for shifts, especially if I want to have a sig correction of a significant amount of shift, uh, uh, these are, uh, these are uh, appro approximate nomograms as you do your surgery. The most important thing in surgery is to be your tip from where you're, where you're holding your tip from, where you're marking from, how you're passing your sutures through your sclera or through your muscle. Be consistent so that you are consistent and are predictable in your outcomes.
a lot of gross nomograms exist it's ideal to start and then look three and follow them for a while and then look for that minor deviation that you may be getting uh, in your outcomes as compared to what is the expect for uh, for uh, attending this ic thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to be here we can take any brief questions if any so thank so thank you uh, no questions comments i think we close on time thank you everybody thank you very much